is the Son of God, the darling of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy. Worthy. Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Down the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day, the soldiers tried to clear the narrow street, <coughs> but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating, there were stripes upon his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. But he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Delavia, Dorosa, call the way of suffering. Like a lamb came my Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me. Down the via. Toro Rosa, all the way to Calvary. Por la via, Toro Rosa, triste die in Jerusalem. Los soldados le abrían paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se acaba, pero ve aquella baba, aquella cruz. Por la vía dolorosa, que es la vía de dolor, como vía vino Cristo, Rey Señor, y fue el que quiso rir. Por su amor, por ti y por mí, por la 
Via Dolorosa A cavar Y a morir Oh, the blood that would cleanse the souls of all men made its way through the heart of Jerusalem. To the Via Dolorosa called the way of suffering like a lamb came by my sire Christ our King but he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me down the Via Dolorosa all the way to Calvary When we talk about the sufferings of Christ, it's hard for us to really comprehend. Because what was wrapped up in his suffering is way more than just the physical afflictions that he experienced. Many men have been crucified. Many men have been tortured. But it was way, way more than that because when he was in the garden, after he had been betrayed by Judas, and he was in the garden and he said to his disciples, my soul, he said, my soul, very important, is nigh unto death. And he asked his disciples to pray for him. And he went alone to pray, and he prayed, and he prayed a prayer that I believe is the number one foundation of all of our prayer lives, and it's this, Father, not my will, but let thy will be done. But he said, Father, if this cup cannot be passed away from me, he said, Lord, I'll drink it. The cup he was talking about is the cup of the wrath, the anger, the judgment of God which was our cup. See, he gave us the cup of life. He took the cup of death. He took the cup of suffering in order to give us the cup of life and blessings. And he drank our cup. And he did it willingly. And he said, Father, not my will. And, of course, we know what happened then. He is sweated as great drops of blood, and he went to find his disciples because the only time he had really asked his disciples to stand with him they couldn't stand with him. He said, the flesh indeed is willing, but the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he said, could you not pray for me one hour? Just one hour. He said, pray that you enter not into temptation. That's why a lot of people into, because they don't pray. They're not talking to the Lord. They're not fellowshipping with God. But, and so he went and he prayed again the same prayer. And, and then he came again and said to his disciples. And then he went and prayed again, Father, not my will. And the Bible says, as he prayed the third time, it says, that angels came and strengthened him because what he was going to do was take upon himself all the sins of the world, my sins, your sins, our punishment, our judgment, our damnation. And there's a great controversy, and I'm not going to get into this, but I am going to read a, out of a book I, of, a, <laughs> of a man I know. <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote a book called Horrors of Hell, Splendors of Heaven. And he tried to explain in here just a little bit about the sufferings of Christ and what Christ went through. So I just want to page, read, read part of that. It says, the sufferings of Christ is still a great mystery to many of those in the church. This suffering did not begin in the Garden of Gethsemane. It literally began before the creation of all things. The sufferings of Christ began, the sufferings of God began before the creation the scripture declares he was slain before the foundations of the world. And I give a number of scriptures here which, which, which backs that up. Revelation 13, 18, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, 
who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. For his birth, from his birth to his resurrection, Jesus Christ has suffered for you and me. In Isaiah chapter 53, it says he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. It broke his heart to see the masses of humanity reject him as their, as, his Messiah, as their Messiah. For he knew that there was no other way than through himself for men to be saved. We can only become partakers of the divine nature through the seed of Christ within the soul of our hearts. It truly is all about Jesus. I would challenge every believer to buy a new Bible and with a yellow highlighter, highlight every time it refers to Jesus in an intimate and personal way, beginning in Matthew through the end of the book of Revelation. You would be amazed and shocked to discover that the scripture refers to Jesus approximately 10,000 times. That's 10,000 times in approximately 350 pages. From Matthew to the end of the book of Revelation, it refers to Jesus in a personal way over 10,000 times. And yet, in a lot of sermons, you never hear his name even mentioned. As we see Jesus moving towards his ultimate sacrifice, his personal suffering increased. The night that he was betrayed by Judas, his sweat he sweat great drops of blood, and it says that in Luke 24, 44, he declared that his soul was close to death because of his sufferings. All of the sins of humanity were being poured into him. He never committed sin, but scripture says that he was made sin, that we might be made to be partakers of his righteousness. All of his suffering, the stripes upon his back, the crown of thorns upon his head, his beard being ripped out of his faith, face, the spitting, the mocking, the bruising of his body, dragging that rugged cross up Golgotha's hill was for our salvation. When they threw his body down upon the tree and nailed his feet and hands to it with spikes, Christ, God in the flesh, allowed himself to be brutalized and violated for our salvation. Even the heavenly father had to turn his back upon his own son. Can you imagine how it broke the father's heart for him to have to turn his back on his only begotten son? Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabakshani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? How could any human being not love him? But that was not the end of his sufferings. Scripture declares his soul descended into hell. This is very important for us to understand. His spirit did not descend into hell, but it returned to Father from which it came. And this is the scriptures. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the spirit, but his soul went to hell. For in Acts 2.31, this is what Peter said. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God, God has raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. The reason why there is so much confusion in some of these areas of understanding is because we have not rightly discerned the word of truth. Many years ago, I discovered not to wrestle with the word, but simply to acknowledge it and believe even if it contradicts everything I've been taught, I simply embrace the truth no matter where it leads, and then God gives me understanding within the context of those scriptures. It is a powerful and beautiful freedom. It is only when we allow the philosophy and doctrination of natural thinking men, which contradicts the teaching of God's word to influence our lives, that we wrestle with the scriptures. This also gives us the, this also gives the enemy of our soul, the devil, the right to blind our eyes from the truth. The soul of Christ took the sins of humanity into the depths of hell to be left there forever. Jesus is able to help us because he knows the pains and the sufferings of not only life, but separation from the Father. He knows the torments of hell. Surely we can trust our eternal souls to such a loving Savior. Christ not only took our sins, but I'm totally convinced, scripturally, biblically. See, we say this. We say this. I was taught this at Bible school. When man sinned, his spirit died. His spirit didn't die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul is the heart, the mind, the will, the emotions. The soul of Christ went to hell. 
But thank God, on the third day, he rose again. But he took our pain, and he took our sufferings. He took what we deserve. Amen. Amen. Brother Angel, you have something you want to share? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I uh, just want to share this principle that I discovered in the word of the Lord, even again this afternoon. And as I was thinking and meditating upon it, there's some mysteries in God we do not understand, especially when it comes to his death and resurrection and all the other things uh, that the scripture implies to us. And in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer to the Hebrews indicates to us that we ought to have a fixed vision. He's the author and the finisher, and our eyes should be fixed, focused totally to what he accomplished for us on the cross. The scripture tells us here in Hebrews two very important things, that he is the author or the initiator of faith, and he is the completer of faith. So he started something that he could finish. He knew exactly what was before him when he became flesh. The program was already set in eternity as pastor has already declared to us. Before the foundations of the world, he was slain. But then it says something that I think becomes a little more difficult to understand. And it's, it's kind of a, a dichotomous thing. How could one thing lead to the other? And how could it be possible that one thing that is the opposite of the other accomplished the full purpose of the living God? Listen to what the word of God says again in that verse. Who for the joy that was set before him. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now when we, we, when we, we think of the cross and we think of joy, we don't see how they come together. We think of suffering and pain as one of the most uh, horrible things that can happen. If you've seen uh, some of the films and movies or even if you've read your scriptures, you know how painful experience uh, Isaiah talks about this beard rip, being ripped from his face. He being so disfigured that you could not recognize him as a human being anymore. Uh, he was just one bloody mess and uh, as he's going through all of this and uh, uh, the, the Roman soldiers had a game that they played uh, Whenever uh, they were going to crucify somebody, or in Jesus' case, they put literally a bag over his head. You have to see the scene. They got this bag over his head, and they are beating him. And your scripture said, they said to us, prophesy. That's exactly what they were doing. They were, they were putting this bag over his face, and then beating on him, and asking him to prophesy as to who hit him, or who struck him. And so all of this pain, all of this agony is going on. He is going to the cross. We understand that very clearly. Uh, we, his disciples run away with great fear. He's bleeding to death on the cross. He has to literally lift himself up just to breathe. And that went on for hours and hours and hours and hours. And in all of that, this is the point that became so very real to me. He counted it all joy. The scripture said that God counted it joy. Now, in the natural, that would seem to us a very uh, sadistic thing. How could you count all that pain, all that suffering as joy? But the scripture says, for the joy that was set before him. Because there's a principle in God that we all need to learn. Is that people who understand the heart of the Father can look into the eternities and understand that all the struggles they're going through now, uh, Romans says, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. 
And Peter talks about the fiery trials that, that we're going through because we're going through changes. And, and some go through changes real easy and others get all upset and they go through changes, all kinds of changes. But, but, but the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him. When the father set out the cross, the father said, this is going to bring joy to my heart. Jesus did not view the cross as a, as a painful, destructive event in his life. He saw it as pleasing the Father and bringing joy to the heart of the Father. It brought joy to the heart of the Father. Now, in the natural, as I said, it would seem, you know, that's crazy. How could you, all that bleeding and all that suffering and all that pain, how could you count that as joy? No joy in that. But see, it's like when they said to Jesus, the Scripture says in the New Testament, they said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen our father Abraham? And he replied, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham saw the day of the crucifixion and the resurrection. When did he do that? When he took his son to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. Uh, God had already promised him. God had already said to Abraham, listen, your seed is going to bless the nations of the earth. Therefore, when God asked him to sacrifice his son, Abraham in his mind, in his spirit man is saying, if he's asking me to give up my son, it must mean he's going to give me my son back. It must mean that my son is going to be resurrected. Now, it's hard for you and I to begin to see through pain. In fact, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book on the power of pain, trying to understand all of the issues that are going on in our lives that maybe we, we don't understand or others may not understand. And in the life of Christ, I'm sure that when his disciples were around the cross, they, they were brokenhearted. Even the, the New Testament reminds us, haven't strange things happened in Jerusalem today? The men that walked on Emmaus who didn't even recognize them because that's one of the things that pain does pain causes you not to be able to see into the realm of the father the way the father wants you to see in the case of Jesus he could see through all of that that's why he prayed not my will be done but thy will be done God I'm not interested in my human perspective on this in the humanness of me, I would shrink away and I would ask you to send all the angels of heaven because he said I could call for legions of angels and y'all would be in trouble. The soldiers didn't have enough sense. After they got slain in the spirit the first time, I, I, they should have ran. But they got up again and they went at it again. And all the things that Jesus did. And yet in his pain, listen, in his pain, he took, the time to be a healer. In his pain, he took the time to be a forgiver. When Peter cut off the ear of the servant, Jesus reached down, dusted it off, and put it back on his face. That would have caused me to repent. <laughs> that would have caused you to repent. You the king, you the king, you know, you the king, I believe in you. On the cross, he dies, and he tells the man, today you will be with me in paradise, expressing the power of forgiveness. So he was able to work through pain until there was power release. I believe that, that, that he becomes our example in that. I believe that that's the way Father God wants us to approach life. We may not fully understand some of the things that we go through, but Jesus is what? Our example. In all sufferings, he is our example. And he was able to go through some stuff in his humanness only, number one, because he depended on the Father. Number two, because he was a fully spirit-filled man. He, he did nothing that he could accomplish without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why I often tell people the same spirit that dwelt in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ now lives in your body. The same Holy Ghost that was on the cross when he died, the same Holy Ghost that he commended to the Father 
when he said, Father, I commend my spirit unto you. The spirit of God that had come to live in that holy body that was there when the healings took place, that was there when the miracles took place, that was there when he walked on water, that was there when, 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 he, when he stopped the storm, it was there when he resurrected the, the, those from the dead, opened the blind eyes, extended the crippled hands. That same Holy Spirit is now here living inside of your body and my body to help witness to the fact that he's the king eternally mortal invisible the only wise God that rules forever and ever and the scripture clearly teaches us that when we identify with him the force of his love is great enough to get us through any pain Remember that pain will cause you some serious trouble. That's why he prays in the garden and, and God had to send angels. God had to send angels to help him get through the moment. And God will do the same for you. He will send angels to, uh, on, his, on your behalf to get you through the moment of that situation. But in whatever situation you're facing, no matter how deep the pain, you can open your eyes and behold him. You can see him in your spirit in all of his agony, but you've got to see him in his resurrection. So this is what it's all about. And they walked on the road to Emmaus, and as they came near to that city, and he's talking with them, uh, and, and he, he opens up their eyes. And when he opens up their eyes, they behold the fullness of resurrection. That's what the Father wants you and I to, to see, the fullness of resurrection, to understand the fullness of resurrection. Resurrection power will get you through any pain that you and I will ever have to suffer. Resurrection power is what Jesus saw for the joy that was set before him. It was fixed. See, as he's hanging on the cross, his spirit man was fixed on the joy. All his spirit man could see was resurrection. All his spirit man could understand is that if I die here on this cross and I accomplish the plan of the Father, I am going to bring redemption to humanity. What price? The blood of Jesus. That blood that was shed for you and I. That blood that cleanses us every drop of his blood changes our lives. Every drop of his blood, yes, every drop of his holy blood touches our lives. His blood, his blood, his holy blood, every drop of his blood touches us in every area of our lives. In a moment, we're going to be partaking of communion together. And, and oftentimes, we so focus on all the, the tragedy and all the pain but I think we need to focus on the resurrection for the joy. So he saw something that most humans never see. They saw into the realm of the Father, the heart of the Father. And he saw that it would please the Father if he would just obey the Father, accomplish the plan of the Father, and bring redemption to you and I. Oftentimes we sing all oh, the blood of Jesus and we, 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 we see all the other things that we read in the scriptures and somehow... We don't seem to understand the great power. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's the same joy that got Jesus through the cross. It's the same joy that's going to get you through all the little pains and, and, and changes you're going to go through. But you know what happens? When he comes riding up into your face. I remember being in Sacramento sitting outside on a Sunday afternoon, just waiting for the evening service when Jesus Christ rose, oh, just opened up the heavens and he rode up in a white stallion right in front of me. And I could see him and the white stallion was just kicking up its heels like that and Jesus was sitting there arrayed like a king. And then he just went away. And I'm, I'm going, whoa. Then he came back a second time. And I remember because the Spanish church was having church inside the building there because they used the building in the afternoon. And he rode up again. And I heard the words so clear, come and follow me. 
and I shouted so loud, Yes, Lord, I will follow you. The dog started barking. People started coming running out of church. They thought I was nuts. But I had just seen the king come in his glory. <laughs> See, that's what we need a, a vision of tonight, this evening. When we take the cup and, with the, and the bread that was broken on our behalf, that we not so much focus on all the brokenness, but we focus on all the power of glory that we obtain through his suffering. Huh. We are cleansing the blood. We know that we can endure. We know that even though we are tried in the fire, we shall be found as pure as gold. We're going to come forth shining. And some of us are going to have a grand entry into the kingdom. And, and some, in, some of the Christians I know, they're, they're going to be glad to make the kingdom. You know? But I don't, Peter says that we should have a great entrance. That there should be great celebration when we get there, you know, because we've made heaven rejoice. You know what rejoices the heart of the Father? When we come together and we allow the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us in our fellowship. There's a mystery. The mystery of the blood is this, that when we come together throughout the book of Acts and over in First John, it says that when we come together, we have fellowship one with another. One with another. And as we're having fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing us. We activate the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus in our fellowship. And something mysteriously happens. He takes we that are here, us, us and if you will. And all of a sudden, Father sees one. And he sees one body. And he sees one, pe one people coming together as one. And when the fullness of that happens, guess what? The Holy Spirit comes. And they were in one accord in one place. And suddenly out of heaven came the sound of heaven and the Spirit of God came upon them. And that's what I desired this evening as I fellowship with him. As we, we love on him, as we break bread together, as we recognize that without him we can do nothing. In him... We can endure all things. I'm sure Pastor could, and I know that I can, tell you many stories of people we've met overseas and people that I deal with all the time that have gone through tremendous struggles and yet come out celebrating with great joy. I have a picture on my computer. I can, I, sometimes I put it up on the front for the background. It's a picture of four little Filipino children in the orphanage dancing around. <laughs> They're just dancing around and holding hands and carrying on. And that picture was taken two days after the typhoon had torn their whole country up. And yet these little children had the time. In the middle of all the suffering, losing anything, they had enough sense to know we've got to glorify God. He's, we're still alive. He's given us breath of life. We've got another day to let, touch somebody's life, to allow the power of his blood to cleanse us. And I, I would just like to pray before pastor comes and, and pray that the Holy Spirit would somehow touch our lives and, and make us understand the power of fellowship, the power of the joy of God, and what it costs for us to enter into that joy, and the power of the covenant blood of Jesus and what it releases into our spirits. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your goodness tonight. I thank you for your kindness tonight. Lord, I thank you that even though in the human mind, I cannot fully comprehend how it could be joy for your son to go through all that brokenness. But I know, Lord, you see things that we don't see. You do things that we, we don't understand. But when we embrace them, you release to us your glory. And Lord, you said you would change us from glory to glory. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the power of your covenant. We thank you for the power of the covenant blood that was shed for us. We thank you for the broken body by whose stripes we are healed. We thank you, Lord, that this evening as we enter into your presence deeper, as we break bread with one another, that your hand is going to be mighty upon us. And, Lord, we're going to understand the fullness of who you are and what you have done. The Bible said that you humble yourself. 
And you stripped yourself of your majesty and laid it aside. And you became human. You became a man. You suffered on our behalf, but you rose again. That every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we do so tonight, Father. We confess that you are the resurrected one. And we give our hearts to you, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Pastor? Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord God. Amen. Thank God for the joy. <laughs> Ooh, to think this life of suffering and agony is going to be with, over with before we know it. For the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in those that love him. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for this night. Lord, as we partake of this communion now, as we partake of the bread and the, the grape juice, you told us to do this in remembrance of you. And so, Father, we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. So let's come. Let's take the, 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 the bread, the unleavened bread. Let's come. And let's take the unleavened bread and let's take a, the cup and let's gather around the altar. Let's gather around the cross. And we'll partake together tonight. With blood drawn from Emmanuel's and sinners plunged. You just line up here. Let's just, you're all doing good. That's wonderful. Let's just come around the altar.
in Matthew chapter 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the broken body of Christ that by the stripes of Jesus were healed. Lord, as we partake of this bread, this unleavened bread, we declare that by his stripes we are healed. And the devil has no right to afflict these temples of the Holy Ghost any longer. So, Lord, I come against every physical affliction. I bind it in the name of Jesus. And I command every physical, mental, emotional affliction to be gone now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and by his stripes right now. Right now. Right now. So, Lord, we partake of this unleavened bread now with a heart filled with thankfulness in Jesus' name. Let's partake. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink it henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Before we drink let's, the wine, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your covenant blood i thank you lord that in taking of this cup we are reminded lord that you will return we're also reminded lord that we activate the power of your covenant we remind ourselves lord that that covenant is actively working right now in our lives let the full blessing of the covenant touch each and every one of our lives tonight as we partake of this cup together in jesus name Amen. Go ahead, baby, sing it. As no Oh, the blood of Jesus singing. Oh, the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, the cleansing blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Sing it the blood of Jesus. All the blood of Yes, it does. It, it washes white as snow. Well, give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Hallelujah. Thank God for the blood. Well, go ahead. Hug three or four necks. God bless. We, we love you. Listen, we're having sunrise service 630 with breakfast 6 30 sunday morning 
We're having sunrise service, 6.30. We're going to have eggs, ham, pancakes, potatoes. Huh? Back here. There's still snacks. There's snacks in the back room if you want snacks. God bless you. We love you. Hallelujah.